Good morning. morning. About six months ago, my cousin Ozzy went to a reunion of all the soldiers that he served with back in the war. And while he's there, he met up with his two best friends, Max and Morris, and they had a wonderful time. And when they left that evening, they made a pact that every time one of them went in a bar to have a beer, they'd actually order three beers, one for each of the other. So how did he get back home to Nunda, South Dakota? He goes into Larson's Tavern, orders three beers. And Lars says, why do you want three? He says, well, I want one for Max, I want one for Morris, and I want one for myself. Those are my army buddies that can't be with me. Lars serves him three beers. This goes on the next week. It goes on the week after that. Every time Ozzy comes in, he orders three beers. Well, one night he comes into the tavern, and he orders two beers. And Lars gets very sad. He says, oh, my gosh, what happened? Was it Max or it's Morris? And Ozzy says, neither one. They're both doing fine. He says, my girlfriend made me join the Lutheran Church, and they insist I quit drinking. <laughs> Just think about it. <laughs> it takes a little while to catch on that one. <clears throat> Last week, if you weren't here, we talked about reality. And reality is everything, as we know. And there are two points that I really tried to make um, impress upon you. And the first is that each of us has our very own unique and individual reality. It is like nobody else's. It's our view of the world. It's what we make of the world. It's what we think. It's what we, how we define different things. And that's unlike anybody else. It depends on the environment you grew up in, your social circles, your education, the uh, goals that you've set, the job that you have. All of that comes in and it gives you a viewpoint of the world and you put meaning into that and that creates your experience. Now the second thing, is that your reality isn't fixed. It's fluid, it, it moves, it can change. We all know that, we've been living in one reality for a long, long time, something happens and we find ourselves in a different reality, totally the opposite of the one that we were in. When it comes to reality, I would like to say that we are in our own reality, we are all alone, and that can seem kind of lonely. But the objective is for our reality to collaborate or to interact with other people in their realities because that's a source of information. It lets us know more about what life is all about. It kind of reflects back to us how we are impressing the other person. Now this isn't a new theory. 2,000 years ago, Jesus did exactly the same thing. He called it the kingdom of heaven. Now over the years, the kingdom of heaven has been kind of uh, manipulated, so to speak, into something that it was never intended to be, and that is if the people are good, if they are God-fearing, if God blesses them, they'll get to go to heaven after this lifetime. And if they're not, they go someplace else. But that was never Jesus' intention. He continually said the kingdom of heaven is within you. And what he meant by that is that the kingdom of heaven is your consciousness. It is your kingdom. You can do what you want. You can take things out of your belief system. You can put things into your belief system. But you're in total control. You know, Dr. Frankel during World War II was sent to an Auschwitz um, concentration camp. And he is one of the few that came out uninjured in an emotional sense. And he said, when I was in there, they can take the food away from me, they can take the clothing away from me, they can take the heat away from me, they can do all sorts of different things to me, but they cannot get into my mind and change one thing that I don't want to change. They cannot control my thinking. And that's the power of our reality. We are in there, and we are in charge of what we think and of the things that we do. Now, you might ask, what is the purpose of being the ruler of our kingdom? Well... <clears throat> We want a healthy environment, we want to feel good, we want to live as long as we can, and those are two primary things, feeling good and living longer. Brigham Young University did a, a research project where over seven years they surveyed tens of thousands of people, people from every walk of life, people from every race, people from every religion, people with every different lifestyle. And over that seven-year period, in 148 different studies, 
they came to the conclusion that there are certain things in life that make us feel good and live longer. Now the list was somewhat long, but I'm going to give you the top six things that help us feel good and live longer. Now surprisingly, the sixth one, the one that is least helpful of this list of six is clean air. That kind of surprised me. After clean air, the next one was exercise. The third thing that helps us um, more than the other two is moderate drinking. The fourth thing is no smoking. No, I missed one, excuse me. After exercise, it's a flu vaccine. Now that surprised me that a flu shot is healthier for me, makes me feel better in the long run than exercise. So then after that, we have uh, moderate drinking, we have smoking, but the top two, the things that make us feel good and help us to live longer, based on all of these tests, is number two from the top, a close relationship. A good friend, somebody you can count on, somebody that you know is always there, somebody that will walk through the valley of the shadows with you, holding your hand. And the number one thing that helps us feel good and live longer is interaction. They call it social integration, but it's interaction with the world around us. And how active are we with that? <clears throat> when you go through your life, do you interact with the cashier at the grocery store? Or perhaps it's somebody at the bus stop? somebody at the job. It's that interaction that, that allows us to not feel isolated with our own reality and brings it a new life of sorts, a new learning about what the world is all about. Sometimes things happen in our lives that aren't pleasant, difficult, painful, and our reality is changed forever. Sometimes a divorce does that. It's very very difficult, it's painful, there's a sense of shame, there's a sense of guilt, there's a sense of failure. All different emotions can enter into that. Losing a, a loved one or a child thrusts us into a different reality altogether. For the first time, as a parent, we no longer have that baby or that son or that daughter that is with us. Uh, losing a job, going bankrupt, all of these things in life happen and they change our reality. Now, every emotion in the emotional scale is valid, whether it be sad, uh, sadness, or whether it be anger, or whether it be uh, laughter, joy, jealousy, whatever it is, every emotion has a degree in which it is beneficial for us. But oftentimes, when we move into these situations that are really difficult and hard for us, we kind of retreat back into our reality. We build up a wall, a border, a boundary, so to speak, and we don't interact with life to the degree we would. Life becomes the enemy. Life becomes fearful. Life becomes that which we cannot trust. So rather than to engage in life, we remain where we were when that difficult hardship came over us. And that isn't easy. But we lose all hope that life can be any better. And the thing about it is, when these people are presented with options on how they can move out of that rut they're in, whether it is, is, is grief or financial ruin or whatever it is, most people prefer to stay where they're at. They cling to the past. They cling to something because they're afraid of the future. A perfect example of this is somebody living in an abusive relationship. And I've talked to so many people over the years where this is the, the situation of their home. And as we talk, we explore different ways in which they can rise above and move beyond this relationship. And in almost every case, the abused person doesn't want to change. He or she tells me that where I'm at isn't easy, and it is abusive, and it is painful, but I know what it is. Moving out of that, I have no idea what the unknown is going to present to me, and it could be a lot, lot worse. So they remain in those conditions, yet life passes them by. In the book Illusions by Richard Bach, he writes of a story about a community of, under, um, of beings that live under the water. 
And they live in this beautiful river, Crystal River it's called, and they have a wonderful life. <clears throat> but then one day, <clears throat> a terrible storm comes through and a huge flood, and they're all um, brought up in this chaotic environment. So scared, they swim to the bottom, they grab hold of rocks so that the, the current won't wash them away. And there they live, generation after generation after generation, clinging to those rocks at the bottom of the river because they're afraid of what happened the last time they were freed to go up and down the river. Well, one day, one of these beings said, I'm sick and tired of clinging to this rock. There's no purpose in life. There's no joy in life. I'm going to let go. And all the other beings said, you're foolish. That's a crazy thing to do. You will probably perish in the process. But the one being lets go. And the light current picks it up and gently floats it down the stream. And as it does, it swims by another community down the, the river. And they see it out there. They're all clinging to the rocks as well. They see this particular being floating by, and they raise their hands and say, it must be the Messiah. Look at him. He doesn't have to cling to rocks. He's not in danger as he floats by. And the one that let go said, no, I'm no Messiah. All I did was let go exactly the same thing that you can do. And you can trust that you'll be delivered to your perfect place. Well, in a sense, that's kind of what we experience sometimes when we have to make big changes in our lives that aren't pleasant. We have to let go of that which we cling to and move on. Trusting in life, it will always deliver us to a place of higher good. When it comes to our reality, as I said before, everybody has a different one. One reality is to look out and observe the world around you. And you see the trees, you see the birds, perhaps butterflies, the blue sky, the white clouds, the flowers, other people coming and going. It's a beautiful world out there. If you stop and think about a better place to exist, there is none. We have it all, perhaps the only place in the universe. But we have this rich paradise of an earth to live on. It's just breathtaking. And when you look out and observe the world around you, with eyes that are looking at the wonder and the beauty of the world, you'll see it everywhere. Yet, only half the people experience that. Only half the people in the United States experience that, that wonder and that splendor and that glory of the world around them because the rest of the people have been hurt, they've been injured, they are afraid, they are buried within their own reality, they're not interacting with life, and it's passing them by. I have a challenge for each and every one of you. It's a seven-day challenge. It's very easy. Once a day, I would like you to find a nice quiet spot in your home, at work, in the park. It doesn't make any difference. And just for two minutes, two minutes and two minutes only, I want you to sit quietly and just observe the world around you. Perhaps there's cars passing by. Perhaps a dog is running around. Birds are flying, whatever. Just observe without thought but absorb the emotion that comes from that. You are a part of that world. Two minutes a day for seven days. And at the end of seven days, I guarantee you that your life will have changed to some degree. You'll have a greater appreciation, a greater understanding, and a greater sense of beauty of the world. Just two minutes. But we lose that too often. We get tied up in difficult situations. And we get tied up in problems and challenges. We get tied up in personal relationship conflicts. And the beauty of the world that was here for us, that is designed for us, is simply passed over. So as we go into meditation, I want you to think about a few things in your life that are just absolutely glorious. Things that are a gift to you. That things that might be inherent in your body as different capacities to do things and go places. If you tried something in the past, and you have failed, and you're afraid to try something again, rise above and move beyond that fear. If you've been in love in a relationship that was good and it turned sour and it turned harsh, rise above that fear and go out and discover a new relationship. Whatever it might be from the past that is holding you back, learn to rise above it, move forward, embrace life. We'll now move into meditation. <clears throat> 